just because you can hear the tuning difference between this and this doesn't mean that you're going to have stellar intonation. But in today's video, I'm going to show you something that, well, also doesn't mean you're going to have like stellar perfect intonation, but should fix about 90% of your intonation problems. I'm Tobias Murphy, and this is Murphy Music Academy. Also, uh, Kavakos' high B flat was slightly higher, by the way. Now, a lot of people tend to think that intonation is primarily a problem of the ear and not a mechanical problem. This is true for about the last 10% of intonation problems that you might want to fix. But for the rest of you, you don't actually need to have that sharp of an ear to be able to start really making some major, major changes to your intonation. The truth is that almost anyone, even the most untrained ear, can really tell the difference between something that is generally in tune and something that is generally out of tune. And yes, that does include your grandmother who came to your recital a few months ago. She could tell. She's still very proud of you, but she could tell. And if you're watching this video, then the chances are you can tell too. So the ear is not really our problem. In fact, most of people's intonation problems are entirely mechanical and they boil down to having problems in what is called hand frame. Now the term hand frame does just refer to the default state of someone's left hand when they are playing basic passages. So there can be such things as good hand frame and bad hand frame. But for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to say hand frame to refer to the good version, as in. That girl's got hand frame. <laughs> okay, way too much fun with that one. So, how do we define proper hand frame? Well, if we look in the good old-fashioned violinist dictionary, we will find hand frame as defined as a default shape of the violinist's left hand, which optimizes both consistency of finger action and accuracy. Now, some of you might be thinking, wow, that is such an incredibly accurate definition, and also at the same time, this does not help me at all. How do I actually get to where I have a default position of my left hand that makes me consistently accurate? I'm so glad you asked. Now, before we get to the exercises, I would say the ultimate goal is to have a default hand shape where the first finger and the fourth finger form essentially roughly a perfect fourth in any position. That is just the spacing in which they naturally fall. This means that if I decide to play one four in first position, my fingers will naturally fall to the proper places. But we'll also do the same if I've been properly trained in hand frame in something like seventh position. Now, as for your second and third fingers, they just need to sit comfortably hovering over the given string that they are playing on or going to play on. So, for example, they need to be sitting in a place just like this to where it's easy for, let's say, the second finger to get to its low or its high position, and the same for the third finger to get to its low or its high position. Now, once you get your hand to have a default position, just like I described, that is half of your intonation problems taken care of. Also, I'd like to quickly in before anyone who thinks I'm exaggerating by saying half. Lest you think I'm selling this as some kind of magic pill instead of the basic aspect of violin technique, which it really is, half of your intonation problems would mean that you're still, you know, would play, I don't know, half of everything if not in tune. And you might Think, what would it sound like if I played 50% of the notes out of tune? Well, it would sound just really, really, really out of tune. So actually, half of your intonation problems is not an exaggeration of having your hand frame shaped. That will fix half of them. There's still another 50% to fix, and that is a lot. But the road to excellence has to start somewhere. So how do we go about finding this good default hand frame? Well, oddly enough, this question does not have a straightforward answer. In fact, it has three. And those three answers depend on whether or not you're a childhood beginner, an adult beginner, or an intermediate player. Now, if you're a childhood beginner, I do have one question. Uh, where are your parents? 
I mean, why are they just letting you, you know, surf YouTube or surf the internet right now? I mean, I think it's great that you found some really great content here, and I suppose if you are playing the violin, this is going to be very good for you, but seriously, go, go play outside. This isn't for you. But for those of you teaching younger kids, the development of the child's hand frame should be something you are concerned about from day one. Now, obviously, from the very beginning, a child is not going to have the best hand frame, and this is largely because whenever a child puts their fingers down onto the strings, the only way they're going to be able to push the string down enough to get a full sound, especially with their tiny violins and their tiny fingers, is to put the tips of their fingers directly onto the strings and squeeze. The better you get, the less pressure you actually have to put onto the strings, but that means that their hands are going to kind of start out with a little bit too curved of fingers, often the fourth finger is going to curve up like this, and that's just something you're going to have to deal with, and you should slowly be training them to have their fingers always hovering over the strings, and their fourth finger always hovering over the strings in that hand frame shape, ready to go, and this could take, you know, a few years to do, and that's fine. For instance, I have a current student, she's about seven years old, been taking for a little bit more than a year, and she's at the point where I get to now work every week a little bit on molding her hand into this default hand frame. So what you'll notice here is that her actual shape of her hand between the first and fourth finger is developed quite nicely. She generally has a good shape of the hand to easily get to both to her first and fourth finger. The issue that we're working with right now is to not curl her fourth finger whenever she plays her third finger, and sometimes this also happens where her other fingers will stick up into the air while she presses down one of usually her third finger or maybe her second finger. Now we are working out those last few little kinks in her hand frame through her review pieces slowly week by week. So I say, okay, we'll play something that you learned a few weeks ago or a few months ago so it's pretty easy for you, and then you can play through some of these little passages slowly and focus on, let's say, not curling your fourth finger while you're putting down one two and three. Because she already knows the music, she can think more about what her fourth finger is doing than she has to think about the actual notes of the piece she's playing. This means that by the time she ends up playing a little bit more difficult music, she will already have developed a nice, solid, and optimized hand frame, which means that she will have fewer technical pitfalls and difficulties playing those advanced pieces than other students who got to that level but weren't trained in proper hand frame which leads me to more intermediate or advanced students whose fourth finger still curls up like this when you put your third finger down how y'all doing? Did you know that the vast majority of your technical problems, at least the vast majority of your technical problems, are due to the fact that you haven't been trained to have your left hand basically shaped like this 99% of the time? Think about it. Anything that complicates the motion of the finger going from above the string down to pushing the string down is going to be less accurate, because if your default hand shape is that your finger goes back to here after it's done playing and then has to get back, who's going to be more accurate? The person that does this? or the person whose finger is already just hovering above that spot and can just go. And the tricky thing is, you can get away with this for a while. At least some of you can. I've seen it happen. Some of my students have been able to get away with this. They didn't start with me, by the way, but some of my students that have come to me from other teachers that weren't trained in proper hand frame, they've been able to get away with this for a good while. But eventually, you will hit a wall, because as music becomes more difficult, you need to simplify every little motion that you possibly can, because there's just too much going on for you to have to account for unnecessary motion. For instance, you can kind of get away with doing this. Now, again, it doesn't sound very good, but you can still kind of get away with it. You can still play through the music. However, there is no way you're getting away with that while playing something like this. So, if your teacher growing up didn't teach you proper hand frame and now you're starting to get stuck in your violin playing because of it, here's what you want to start doing. And it's actually pretty simple. Start practicing scales, focusing on keeping all of your fingers hovering above their spots, roughly above the spots where they need to be on any given string. Now, of course, you're going to want to go very slowly at first because you have likely developed some bad tendencies. Again, this is what I see all the time where people's fourth finger curls up like that. That's probably what you just tend to do naturally, so you're going to have to fight yourself to get yourself to not do that. But if you go slow enough and really make that mind-muscle connection, you can do it. Speaking of the fourth finger, I know that a lot of you have trouble getting to or playing the fourth finger while keeping all of the rest of the fingers in 
in their same positions. Now, that has less to do with the size of your hand and more to do with your mechanics. So, there's an easy way to fix this to find the right elbow because it's usually the elbow position that is the problem. So, here's what you want to do. You want to hold your violin like a guitar like this, okay? Take your thumb, put it underneath the violin like this, so the pad of the thumb is under the neck, and then you want to find all four fingers of a given string in the right place. So again, you're gonna kind of pinch the string like this. So thumb here, find, okay, I'll just start in my G string. So that's my open G. Then find first finger, that's in tune. Second finger, and you wanna make sure you keep these two fingers down. Now third finger, now fourth finger. And you'll notice the shape of my hand as it is in relation to the fingerboard is a little bit different than what it would be up on my shoulder. Now we're gonna keep the same shape of the hand and now we're going to keep all of this, make sure it doesn't move, and put it on your shoulder like this. Now what you'll notice here is that most likely your elbow is gonna come forward a lot more than you were previously used to and this is the mechanical problem you were having. Your elbow was too far back here and your fourth finger couldn't reach because what this does is this brings this side of the hand a little bit closer to the fingerboard which means that the fourth finger now doesn't have to stretch as far. So if you were having problems getting to your fourth finger or keeping your fourth finger and the rest of your fingers hovered over their spots while practicing hand frame, this is a good starter exercise to sort of get your hand into that position. And likely you're gonna find an elbow position somewhere between what you were using right now and this really far forward elbow position doing this ends up finding for you. But this is a good place to start. So you get yourself in this position, try to focus on getting your fingers to hover above the strings, and then just start playing a scale. Focus on keeping the fingers hovered. And if you need to, to help you focus, just stop in between each note and focus on how you're keeping the hand frame and pushing your fingers down. Of course, the scales are where you're going to really isolate this type of practice, but you want to try as much as you can to put the hand frame into any pieces you play. Of course, you want to focus mostly on just being able to play your pieces. You're not gonna fix this overnight. But if you do the two-step process of isolation practice in your scales, and then trying to do it as much as you can in your pieces, over time, you will develop this more efficient hand frame, and your playing will just generally get better. But your general hand frame and hand shape is, as I said earlier, only about 50% of your intonation problems being fixed. So let's get to the final 40%. But this really isn't a desk job, so let's go to the practice room. Now, once we've started to establish a proper hand frame, the next thing we want to work on is to make sure that our fingers, now that their position over the string has been optimized, can get to their proper spots on the string every single time. Now, besides, of course, scales, one of the things I found that works best for solidifying the accuracy of your finger action from this proper hand frame are subjects' left hand exercises. Now, of course, there are many different step chip books, both for the right and for the left hands. For this particular video and for these exercises, I'm going to be using the first page of the School of Violin Techniques, Opus 1, Book 1, which will have an IMSOP link in the description below. And I will also put these exercises on the screen while I'm using them so you can see exactly what I'm doing with which part of the exercise. Now, if you're looking at the link, or maybe you have your own copy of the book, or you're just looking what I'm throwing up right here, you'll be able to see that in this first page, what we have are a bunch of isolated measure, isolated little fragments of notes that are meant to be played faster and faster. So for the first one, we just have A, one, two, one. Which is then meant to be played in eighth notes after you played in quarter notes. and then meant to be played in 16th notes. Wow, that's incredibly simple. You might ask, how is that supposed to help me fix 90% of my intonation problems? Well, the answer to that actually lies in the simplicity because this allows us to focus on finding the most basic, simple, and efficient manner of putting our fingers down onto the strings and just hammering that home. 
Of course, you can't just go into this all willy-nilly and just play through the exercise and expect it to fix anything for you. That's not how exercises work. You have to be very purposeful with how you practice it. Now, the first thing we kind of already covered, which is hand frame and finger action. Of course, you want your fingers to generally be in this shape, hovering above their general spots over the string at all times, or as much at all times as you can possibly muster. And you want the finger action to be very small, very simple, and just straight up and down like this. Now, the next part of this, which we're going to cover now in this exercise, is what I like to call pinpoint intonation, where we're not just practicing the action and making sure that's as efficient as possible, we are making sure that the pathway that the finger travels to get to the string is as consistent and as accurate as possible, and training that as much as we can. What this would look like in practice is, let's say, you just play the first measure of this exercise, the A121. And let's say you notice one of the notes is a little off. Let's say you play that C natural a little too high. Now, of course, you want to keep your ear very sharp for that type of thing. You want to be as picky as possible. If you want, get a tuner out. But no matter what you use to help you judge your intonation, what matters now is the mechanics. So, what we're going to want to do, let's say we play that C natural a little too high. What we're going to do is now, of course, aim just a little bit lower. Doing this enough times, we are going to refine the movement of that finger to that spot. And that there, that refining, that is the key. The more you practice really aiming your fingers as you do these simple exercises, and of course, try to do it as much in your pieces as well, that is what's going to solidify not just your hand frame, but also the action of your fingers going to the right spots without you actually having to, th eventually, without you having to think about it that much. Practice this this way for enough years in enough different positions, and eventually you will solidify the way your hand is shaped in every position and the action of the fingers to essentially have a default state of playing in chess. Tune. Now, of course, one more thing before I go, and that is when you are practicing aiming your fingers, you want to be aware, and this goes for both septic or any other exercises and scales and your pieces, anything that you're practicing intonation for, one thing you want to think about is the fact that your finger action is essentially not like you fired a bullet, which once you pull the trigger, there it goes, you can't get it back. You want to think of it more like a spear, where until it reaches its target, you get to control every aspect of its movement. So a lot of people, once their finger starts moving, they are no longer aiming their finger. The finger starts moving and boom, it goes down. And if it's in tune, it doesn't matter. If it started on the path that was gonna send it to be out of tune, it doesn't matter. They have just essentially allowed it to go off like a bullet. You wanna think of your fingers as spears. So one way you wanna practice putting your fingers down as slowly as you possibly can within a given tempo, which doesn't always mean that you're putting them down slow. It just means that you're controlling their pathway the entire time. So I'll pick the second measure from the exercise, which is one, two, three, two. If I were trying to pinpoint practice my intonation here, I would want to make sure, and let's say my third finger was off, was a little flat, maybe a little high, and I wanted to aim in the opposite direction, I wouldn't just throw the finger down, try to throw it down a little bit lower if I was too sharp. I would want to very slowly aim my finger and think about the fact that I get to control the action of my finger all the way down to the string. So I'd want to go and really try to find that exact spot. That is another thing that you're going to want to add to this one, especially when you first start out, start out doing your pinpoint intonation practice, because that is what's really, really going to train your fingers to always find that correct pathway. So in short, if you teach your hand to have a proper shape between one and four in every position, which means as you go up positions, that shape gets a little bit smaller and you train yourself to have that shape in the default, no matter what position you're in. And then you always have your fingers hovering above their spots. And then you train the action of all of your fingers going down to be consistent as possible. That is going to take quite a few years, but it will fix 90% of your intonation problems. Unless you think I'm exaggerating, obviously there's still another 10% to fix. And that's for all the stuff that sometimes, which especially when you get into more difficult music, falls out of the range of proper hand frame. Sometimes fingers have to stretch for things. Sometimes your hand gets in weird positions. Sometimes you have to play in high positions across all four strings. All of those things are going to be outside of the frame outside of the frame of proper hand frame. And those are the things that you're going to have to sort of work specifically on in your music. But if you have a default shape to your hand that plays in tune, 
generally, then that is going to fix a lot of those other problems, which means you get to spend those other, that extra time on those last 10% of intonation problems. Now you may think three years just to work on this one thing, even though it's a thing that, you know, affects just about every other thing I play. That's kind of a long time. Isn't there any easier way? Maybe you clicked on this video thinking, oh, this is one of those quick and easy tips, three easy ways to fix your intonation problems instantly, and that's not really what I do here. It will take some time, but you know what? That time is worth it. Because you know as well as I do that there is no pleasure in mediocrity. I've been Tobias Murphy from Murphy Music Academy, and happy practicing. I'll see you next time.